Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this fourth episode of the Late Night Conference. My name is Wilhelm Huck, and I'm your host tonight. I can't believe it is another month gone. We are still in curfew, but there is progress. Curfew has now gone from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m., so I guess uh, we can enjoy our evening tonight and still get home in time. Um, by the way, um, the best April Fool's Day joke I heard today was one of my colleagues telling us in a large Zoom meeting that he had heard that plants apparently can spread COVID as well. And uh, he had already removed them from his office. I would say poor plants. So. Um, there we go. Um, we're talking about life already. And today's uh, guest is certainly someone who explores the very essence of the chemistry of life. And to give you an introduction, one of the intriguing questions that people have been talked about for, for decades, I guess, is whether life can really consist of only the molecules that, or maybe even elements, that we typically come across. And so you, you always have molecules containing carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, but typically not silicon, for example. Uh, and my gut feeling is that if you look at the thermodynamics of the carbon-oxygen versus the silicon-oxygen bond, then you will understand that if you breathe out CO2, then you can recycle that CO2. But if you would breathe out silicon oxide, which is sand, then you would never be able to recycle that again. Still, that leaves us with a question, of course, to say, well, what are really then molecules that are typical for life? And our guest tonight, uh, Professor Lee Cronin, has developed new methods to determine if a molecule is produced by living creatures or not, in a very novel and unbiased way, using mass spectrometry and quite a bit of artificial intelligence, I suppose. So. Um, another area that Professor Cronin is rightly famous for is his love for gadgets. Uh, he, his dream is to make a robot laboratory, and I'm sure we will see snippets of it tonight, where experiments are fully automated, where samples are injected into mass spectrometers, uh, fluorometers, whatever matter you, you can think of, uh, and the analysis is automated, and the results are then fed into some algorithm that dreams up new reactions for the robot to carry out. And I think this is a really exciting vision, uh, and I hope we will learn more about these laboratories of the future tonight. To give you a little bit more background about our guest, uh, Lee studied chemistry at the University of York, where he also obtained his PhD, uh, uh, specializing in inorganic chemistry. After postdoctoral positions in Edinburgh and Bielefeld, he took up his first academic position in Birmingham, uh, but moved to Glasgow in 2002, where he has been ever since, uh, very rapidly rising through the ranks, and he's now the Regius uh, Professor in Glasgow. He really has won too many prizes to list tonight. We would spend all, all evening. Uh, let's just say his CV is massive. Uh, one thing I think that I would like to mention is that Lee is also a movie star. You, you, he's very good at communicating his science. He's uh, very active on Twitter, but perhaps you should all watch the movie Inorganica 2013. Uh, in which, as the IMDb database cites, a Scottish scientist seeks to answer one of the greatest questions by creating new life in a lab. It's a highly recommended uh, movie. Uh, actually, for people in Nijmegen, they probably have seen this a few years ago uh, at the uh, uh, Science Movies uh, Film Festival. So let me keep it at this. Uh, we have an accomplished chemist here tonight. Uh, who is well known to tackle extremely challenging problems uh, and he has no problems commuting uh, his science and I'm sure it's going to be a very exciting evening. Before we start, please let me remi remind you that we are looking for interesting questions uh, from you, our audience. Uh, um, put them in the chat and we'll pick them up later on. Uh, they can be on anything from specifics of the science that we're about to hear to career advice, although I'm not sure uh, what kind of answers you're going to get from that one, uh, uh, but we all want to know how to win a Nobel Prize. That's what we uh, tried to ask Jack Shostak last time, and who knows, maybe Lee has some his, uh, his ideas on that as well. Uh, um, anyway, uh, please like our video, remember to subscribe to our channel, and click the bell so you will get notified for our next episodes. With that, 
we are ready to start. Lee, the Zoom is yours. Thanks very much, Wilhelm. And it's really nice to be here. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about assembly of, the, of life in the universe. And what I'm going to do this evening is kind of give you a quick tour through what we're doing in our group in Glasgow and with collaborators around the world to try and ask what life is and can we make it and not what did happen, what does happen. And I think one of the things about the origin problem is people think that it's a historical problem, but it's not a historical problem. It's really current. Um, let's go back to the Big Bang. So here you can see the crystallization of, uh, of energy and matter and um, after the Big Bang, and then suddenly you get something from nothing. And what's really important to figure out is that we're part of this cosmic journey where the universe um, through creating galaxies and, and stars and planets exploding, uh, sorry, stars exploding, that created the stuff that gave rise to chemistry. So these lonely planets that exist in the universe that are being made right now are maybe a vast number of them are alive. And I want you to think about tonight, not what did happen on Earth, but what is happening around the universe right now. Look up in the, star, the sky tonight, if it's a clear night, look at some stars, there will be exoplanets around those stars. And then ask the question, are they alive? The next question is, how can we find out? Tonight, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about that. So before we can do that, we have to ask what life is. And this is a bit of a hard problem, because if you ask a bunch of chemists and a bunch of biologists what a life is, they might argue with you. In, even if you ask if a virus is alive, you'll get contradictory um, questions. And so really, the idea about what we mean by uh, life or not alive um, is kind of hard. And this picture here is some graphics that some of my team have been doing. In fact, one of my uh, team members, she's an artist as well as a, uh, did a PhD and then a postdoc. This is supposed to depict a kind of sand man, these crystals coming together and this object. And as Wilhelm said at the beginning, surely silicon can't give you living creatures. Well, maybe if the planet has a completely different pressure and temperature, you can breathe out uh, um, silicon dioxide. Maybe there is another way that you can think about these things. And so it's hard to understand what life is. But if I can um, show you this pitch, this video of this flame on the left hand side and this, this growing colony of cells on the right hand side, um, you can understand that maybe life does have something to do with dissipation of energy and the use of resource. But really, that's not good enough. So perhaps what I will do for a moment is sidestep the question of what is life and ask a different question, which maybe is a bit easier. How can we detect life? So because perhaps if we can detect life and then we can get more than one instance of life in the universe and understand that, we might be able to get some common themes and then start to define it properly. And so one of the things I want to do a lot of is to try and understand how we might even bother um, to try and detect life. But first of all, let's ask why bother for artificial life or to find aliens, right? Which is ultimately what I'm trying to do. And when I explain this to my funders, they're saying, well, we don't really want to pay for that necessarily. You know, what about things on Earth? And, um, but I would argue that the first contact with alien life will be very big. And we, NASA has tried very hard with meteorite um, analysis and looking um, and Viking experiments but we just don't have a universal understanding of what life is. And there's lots of hypotheses out there. And we're really very confused, whether it's looking for microfossils or interpreting the um, results of a space probe. So to help with that question, I'm going to ask us all to participate in a question. So those of you watching on YouTube, please um, um, look at the next slide where I say, right, from evolution or not. So what you have to do is look at the object and think to yourself, did evolution produce um, uh, that um, uh, object or not? And so there, you've got here a snowflake. So I think you might all agree with me that evolution did not produce a snowflake. Um, um, the, the, the crystallization of water did. This sand dune um, did not require evolution. But what about the sand castle? Could this sand castle exist without evolution? And you might think, well, it's got sand in it, the sand could be created naturally, but of course the features in that sand castle um, are such that there's no way those features could be put there randomly, they were put there by a human being, and the human being was created by evolution. 
Um, this brick was also created by evolution by a human being, but it doesn't really have enough features. If you found that brick on Mars, um, you might um, be uh, forgiven for mistaking it as just a rock. Whereas if you found that sandcastle on Mars and you found a whole bunch of them, um, you might conclude that Mars has a living uh, people making sandcastles. Same with this dust mite from evolution. Now we get to this protein. In fact, this let this slide, I got this picture many years ago before the age of COVID. Um, if you ask yourself if COVID-19 is alive or not, well, that's the wrong question. Was, did evolution produce COVID-19? And the answer is yes. And in fact, when COVID is in your cells, it is replicating and, um, and it is most certainly alive as part of your cellular machinery. Um, but obviously when, it gets, when you expel COVID and you breathe it out, it's no longer functionally alive, but has the potential to be alive. Um, and so really the question of asking if something is alive or not is hard. But I think you would argue that um, um, evolution is a good connector. Are you connected to Luca, the last universal common ancestor? Um, and so what about this protein here? This protein, if you look carefully, you might be able to convince yourself it's hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is indeed from evolution. Now the Tesla, well, the Tesla is made by Elon Musk and his crew. If Elon, Elon Musk might be an alien, but I'm guessing that it is produced by evolution. But now let's get to the final two parts of this, this molecule here. This molecule's morphine. Um, I'm sure there's some chemists watching. What probably you want to ask yourself at this point is, can molecules be made by evolution? And I think the answer we would all agree is yes. Um, but how many features does that molecule need for the, to prove to you that it was made by evolution and not a bit like this rock? And my final entry is uh, Boris Johnson, uh, you know, whether he's, he is the product of evolution. I used to have Donald Trump on this slide and uh, I changed it for Boris because, you know, Donald is banned, Boris is still going. So let's get to the question. We want to kind of understand um, how to detect life and the big question of the origin of life. Whereas I'm not so motivated by the, the question of the origin of life, um, and I'll spend in one minute maybe explaining why that is. If you look up at the sky and you look at our sun and you ask yourself, how did our sun form? Our sun is very special to us. And obviously it used to be the center of the universe or sorry, earth used to be the center of the universe, but then we gave it to the sun. This, well, we, the sun starting is very important for us because it gives us all the energy that we, we need and is responsible for evolution on earth. However, the origin of the sun is not a particularly important event is an average star in an average universe. Now, if you think about the origin of life on Earth, and I think, oh, OK, there are, there are exoplanets everywhere. Now let's imagine life coming into uh, being on many planets in the universe. We really need to stop worrying about the historical contingency that's re related to Earth and think more broadly. To do this, I guess we need to think about where complexity comes from in general, how replication uh, gets started, when does evolution start and what can be the, the life be based on and what are the limits? And I would like to kind of start to answer this with a question, uh, with, an, with an answer to that question at a moment. But first of all, we could imagine that peptides or proteins might give rise to replication or DNA or RNA. But actually, I think that's totally wrong. I think that RNA had nothing to do with the origin of life. I think that in fact, all the chemistry of biology right now wasn't present at the origin of life. Um, and it's a really a, a, a false kind of idea. It's a bit like taking apart, I'm sure Wilhelm has a Tesla Roadster or some very, very posh car. And it's like basically taking his car apart and looking for evidence of the first automobile made by, you know, Henry Ford and, and, and other people. He may have a bicycle actually, he might tell us in a second. And so looking for the chemistry at the origin of life is really an interesting and non-trivial question. So I wanted to go back and ask a different question and say, right, my thesis is that, is that complex molecules aren't spontaneous. And rather for looking at for chemistry that might have been present at the origin of life, ask a different question. So what is the question I want to ask you? I want to ask you how complex molecules are made. And I would like to give you an example of Taxol that I'm showing you building up here in steps. Taxol is one of the most complicated molecules we know. It is a, it's a natural product. 
uh, made by biology, made in the metabolic network. It's got a very uh, nice looking formula, C47H51NO14. Its molecular weight is 853.33. But let me tell you this, there are more possible molecules with that formula than there are atoms in the universe. So let that sink in for a second. There's 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe estimated, but with that formula, there's more possible molecules uh, possible from the laws of chemistry and mathematics than there are atoms in the universe. And so when you're thinking about the universe of molecules, um, if you were to go to Mars and find a milligram of taxol, I would argue that you would, you would know that um, uh, Mars had an evolutionary process associated with it that produced life, uh, produced taxol, because taxol can't randomly form in any detectable abundance. And that's a very important phrase to say, in any detectable abundance. So what I wanted to do is build a theory that explains to me how I could find complex objects um, in um, the environment, be it DNA or a artifact made by an alien uh, or a sculptor. So how can we do this? Can it lead us to a new theory for life? Well, to do this, we have to think about um, how um, we look at assemblies of objects. So the theory that I've been developing in my lab, and it's a bit odd for an experimental chemist to start looking at a new physics theory. And part of this we've been doing in collaboration with one of your previous speakers, Sarah Walker at Arizona State University. And one of the things that we wanted to do is ask ourselves, what is the difference between disorder and complexity? Um, and can we find, is there another thing that we can look at beyond disorder and complexity? Because complexity is a hard thing to compute. Computer scientists and mathematicians like complexity classes in, our, in looking at mathematical space. Disorder, in, when you look at entropy, just tells you what you lost. But I want to know what structures you have. How much memory does the universe have or the molecular system have, uh, system have? And we call this assembly. And so from this, we've called, we created a theory called assembly theory. Now, I'm going to go through it very quickly here because of time um, constraints, but it's not particularly tricky uh, the way I've described it, but it is a bit, there are some very um, significant um, outcomes. What is assembly theory first? Well, it describes the minimum number of steps needed to construct a given object. So imagine making, say, a um, piece of art or piece of origami or to, to um, construct a Lego um, 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 kind of object, maybe um, a house or something. What you'd ask you to do, you'd have to go to the box of Lego bricks and each time you pick out a brick, that requires some information. But if you could pick out five bricks at once and link them together, and then you know that you've done that, that, mo that you understand that control, you could carry on doing that um, in steps to make more and more complex objects without having to go back to the individual brick. It's about adding things together. Assembly information is a function of the abundance of the objects. So if you find taxol and you only find one molecule of taxol you know, in space, that doesn't really tell you very much because random stuff like that may happen. There is a very, 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 very small chance that lactaxol could randomly form. Well, actually, I'm just saying that to keep the physicists happy, the, the, the statistical mechanicists, I can tell you pretty much it's zero chance. But the point is the higher the assembly number, the lower the, 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 the number of objects that will be accessible using random events. I'll say this final thing again one time. The higher the assembly number for the objects, the lower the number of objects that will be accessible. So, the, um, so it's very rare to find high assembly objects um, using random events. And let me explain why. In this slide, I show how assembly theory works on building blocks and then on letters and then on chemistry. But on the right hand side here, I show you this kind of tree root assembly step diagram. Forgive the mathematics, but look at the graph, which says probability of the most likely path and then the assembly path. Now, what I mean by this, the assembly path is a number of footsteps you need to take down a tree. And every time you make a step, you make a decision. And for a molecule that has an assembly number of 15, OK, if you look on the graph here with this alpha, this is about the kind of the kinetic control. But with an alpha of about three, um, when you get to assembly number 15, there is 
If you look at a mole of molecules, there will only be roughly one molecule in that entire, uh, um, in that mole that's identical, because there's so many possibilities. So when you take 15 steps, there's a mole of possibilities. And that means um, there's very many things to choose from. So when we learn to explore chemical space and using assembly theory, we can count the steps to make the molecules. So we can look at um, um, uh, something as complex as ATP or something simple like asparagine. And then we can look at chemical space and see that molecular weight um, and molecular assembly um, have some correlation low down, low molecular weight, but something remarkable happens at medium molecular weight. There's assembly numbers everywhere, which means that molecules can adopt a wide variety of assembly numbers. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is if I went into outer space and I could find a molecule that has a high assembly number and it's high enough, I can tell you it's an alien. That's my kind of hypothesis. Okay, how do we do this? Well, there's a, what we've been doing in my lab is building experimental measures for molecular assembly. And we've found that by using mass spectrometry, we can take molecules, put them in the gas phase and break them apart by fragmenting them and then counting the number of parts. And what we found is that the assembly number calculated theoretically and the number of fragments we see in the mass spec correlate. Now it's not a one-to-one -one correlation because mass spec is kind of breaks a lot of, breaks bonds everywhere, but we do get a correlation and we don't get any false positives. So we were able to build an assembly measurement system. We were able to take uh, um, materials from all around the world and outer space, and from dipeptides to seawater to um, wh Scottish whiskey and beer. Um, and we were able to find that basically things that came from life only produce molecules that have a high assembly number. So this is kind of interesting in that we're finding that Life can produce complex molecules, whereas non-life that cannot. And if you burn the molecule, you obviously you lose the complexity. And that gives us a very interesting um, way to search the universe and our laboratories. So now we have a detection system for, um, for life. We know that life can produce high assembly objects and we can mass spec to do it. So can we now translate that in the laboratory and start thinking about um, searching for ke new chemistries that will make uh, complex biologies, um, uh, make biology at all, in fact. So of course, from the origin of life, people have been looking at you know, primordial soup and whatever pet, pet dogma you have, insert your dogma here, it's fine. Assembly theory is dogma free. So I don't mind if you love the RNA world, it's probably not right, but let's go test it. Let's not use the dogma. I don't mind if you like the peptide first world, let's go test it. And the way to do that is to kind of think about how we would do chemical synthesis um, in a, um, uh, a system that allows us to explore chemical space. But there's a problem. If we don't, the dogmatists or the people that look at prebiotically plausible scenarios would say, look, hey Lee, you're being too tough on us. There's too much chemistry to do, and we have to start somewhere. And I'd agree that it's a really hard problem. But if we rather instead built a state machine, a chemical robot, that would start to explore chemical space randomly by mixing stuff and trial and error, maybe we might find how life can emerge, not just on Earth, but anywhere. So what I did about 10 years ago is I bought, built a chemical state machine. And all the chemical state machine is, it's basically a robot with a, with, a, with a computer language that is a chemical language that we write in the, in the laws of chemistry, do reaction, do separation, um, you know, and, the, and, and all that type of stuff. And we, we put the unit operations together as shown here. We have a scheduler, we execute, we look at the state. But let, let me not show you a boring uh, picture. Let me show you a couple of quick videos that will go very fast. On the left-hand side, they're showing us building our chemical state machine and all the pumps and the valve. On the right hand side, um, showing you how you can take some, um, um, some chemical recipes and write them in the robot and basically get it to do the chemistry that's happening on the left hand side. I apologize that I've got two very dense videos running at the same time, but you should be able to kind of, uh, kind of see what's going on. On the left hand side, the robot is controlling the chemistry. And on the right hand side, we're able to do a design of experiments through that chemistry. Because this 
is the kind of foundation of the search for um, new life that we want to do in the lab. Now here, um, obviously, if I went to funders, I don't know what it's like um, everywhere, but if I went to a funder and said, hey, I need 10 million pounds to make an origin of life engine, please. And I don't know if it's going to work. The funders might say, oh, you know, Lee, we really like the origin of life idea, but, you know, RNA did it. And so don't worry. Um, but if I, but what I did instead is say, well, hey, hang on, why don't we look and do drug discovery? And they said, oh, great, have some money. And by the way, once we're doing drug discovery, can we use this to um, repurpose it for the search for um, uh, new life forms? They said, okay, go on. And that's kind of one of the quick points I wanted to make to young scientists here. It's like, don't be, you don't have to lie about your vision, but sometimes when, you, when you, your funders and your peers don't share your vision, just say, well, what are you interested in? And find a common overlap. And one of the reasons I built the computer was because of my um, desire, my certainty that we need to build an origin of life engine. CERN has a wonderful machinery publicity machine. The Large Hadron Collider, everyone was on the edges of their seats. Is the Higgs there or not? Um, and, and that, and you know, and it's a multi-billion dollar experiment spilt, spent on um, fundamental particle physics. I think we should have a multi-billion dollar um, worldwide project spent on looking at the origin of life and artificial life. And I'm sure many of people watching this today would agree. So we have to go in the lab and build this, but what are we doing? Well, rather than using dogma, we need to use probability. By having a Bayesian um, framework for the origin of life, that we might be able to think about, okay, let's test the RNA world. So let's put some RNA in a pot and mix it and do chemistry and understand what's happening in terms of assembly space. We measure the assembly number. Is the RNA becoming more lifelike? And then we can then kind of um, change our priors as a function of what we, we observe um, in the laboratory. So we can change this using the observation from our living soup, the likely ob observation from a non-living soup. So that's the kind of idea. So now we've got the computer, we have the probability, and then we had the kind of trial and error we were doing in my group a few years ago to get ready to use the computer. We want to basically do complex chemistry with complexity that depends on its history. And we need to explore um, soups and we need to automate many reactions and it's very, very messy. And the kind of workflow that we've got is this mass spec workflow that applies uh, assembly theory. And I know that there are other teams in the world using mass spec as well and looking using other theories which are equally as valid and interesting um, to explore how mole molecules are moving through um, these complex mixtures. But the point I want to make is that the automation is coming together the theory is coming together. And finally, um, the analytical chemistry is coming together. So we've been doing um, uh, exploration of soups with computers. We've been running experiments for more than 30 days. We're generating lots of data. I mean, uh, uh, Wilhelm said at the beginning, I'm a bit of a geek. I have a dream of, of, of generating a petabyte of data in a few weeks. We're actually not that far away. We're generating hundreds of terabytes of data, which is a real nightmare. And what we're doing, is we're looking for the assembly number increase. But I've only got two slides left, and I'm gonna try and bring this all together to explain what we're actually doing. We've got a new approach to creating life. That is programming the search for mess. And when we have a history in that mess, does that give rise to evolution? Because my theory, and I think I'm not alone in sharing this theory, is that biology did not create evolution. Evolution created biology. And we should stop worrying about what did happen. And instead we should worry about what does happen. So to do that, we had to make a new theory for biology and evolution. We had to build a model to simulate the emergence of biology. We have to then have a machine to emerge to new biology and we need to have a metric. And so this figure here is a figure that um, Sarah and I produced when we were writing a perspective uh, many years ago for science to say, look, Origin of life is really interesting. It's great, there are so many people involved from lots of different areas, where the RNA world, the peptide world, whatever. But what about if we start thinking about coming from a non-living world and putting information into the system? And I think that's kind of the thing I want to leave you with, that, that we can see, start to see with assembly theory, the propagation of information through chemical systems and when they become um, uh, open-ended evolvers. 
I want to stop here. I'm stop, going to stop um, uh, perfectly on 25 minutes. And I must, and I want to thank my team here. It was the year of the lockdown. So we all took lockdown selfies. I would love to um, thank them for their hard work. I also must acknowledge um, the University of Glasgow who've been really supportive, European um, Research Council, um, the EPSRC who were key funders, the Templeton Foundation who also actually funded the origin of life work explicitly. They were really supportive of the mathematical development. And without the Templeton, I wouldn't mean I get that off the ground and all these other funders here. But last but not least, I'd like to thank Wilhelm and his team for putting this on and also you guys for listening and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lee. That was a fantastic, uh, fantastic presentation. Um, you, you've shown us an insight in the work that you're doing, but also the thoughts that you have behind it. And you, you started with the assembly number, you moved to your computer and your, your new robot lab, and, and you ended up with a new, well, new theory of life, new approach to creating living system. And, and I think the message that we can take from tonight is that um, evolution created biology. And the question is, of course, what created evolution? And that's maybe something that we can talk about right now. Uh, before we do that, um, I can show you the car that I don't have, but my <laughs> students thought they will give me a Porsche, but this is the o only thing I've got. So, so yeah, we, as you know, in the Netherlands, we just cycle. That's all right. Perfect. Um, well, my, my, my first question was really going back to your assembly number, where you, you talk about the probability of such a molecule being formed, but many of the chemists in the audience might well say, well, of course, it's not completely random. There's a lot of chemical reactions that have to take place, and they are driven by the laws of chemistry. And so that's why you end up with these molecules. I, I would say that they're wrong. And I would say the laws of chemistry are, are contingent upon biology. And I would say that what are the laws of chemistry? The laws of chemistry are really simple. They are the periodic table and quantum mechanics and reactivity. So think even something like a, the simplest chemical reaction you can think of. You need pure reagents. You need a flask. You need to specify the pressure the temperature, and so on. So I would say that reactions do not really exist that give you high assembly number objects. Only reactions exist to give you maybe low assembly number objects. And what the challenge is, is how those reactions give you high assembly, can make the leap to high assembly number. And so what I'm doing right now is to say, it's not that reactions don't exist, of course they do, but reactions are the product of evolution on Earth PV equals NRT, one atmosphere, 298. And I'm really excited about this observation and I'm going to be um, discussing that. And I think this is a good argument to have because I'm sure people won't accept that, but I think we have to use that as an extreme example because some chemists think that complex molecules can just magically form. They can't, they need well, information. I, they couldn't, I, I would not say that they could randomly form, but likewise, if you shake a box with atoms, then the number of possible molecules, hypothetical molecules, will be very large. But in practice, the actual number of molecules formed will be much smaller. And Correct. I, so, so we're saying that. So when you shake your box with lots of atoms in it, you just get low assembly number because your box only gives you um, the, the constraints are very small. So the, the question is, how do you get contingency and constraints into your reactions. So my guess is that you have to interact with the inorganic environment. Maybe there's some chance catalysis you might get from a mineral. Maybe there is a, a biphasic event that occurs. And so the question is to find, of course, complex molecules had to form. If they didn't form, we would not be here, but there's no big leap. And so what we have to look for is those autocatalytic cycles low down in small numbers that can give you a trajectory in space away from the boring norm of those of those atoms to somewhere a bit more special that has some function associated with it and i think that's a really exciting search that we're all on right now 
Yeah, and I think certainly the interaction of molecules or reactions and their environment, uh, I think is definitely one of the things that we have to take into account. Uh, you also mentioned catalysis is, is extremely important because otherwise the, the range of chemical reactions will still be fairly limited. Uh, uh, whether we need autocatalytic cycles, I think there is some autocatalysis probably required, but if, if everything has to be built on autocatalytic cycles, I, I, I don't know. I think that you can show auto mathematically that all the autocatalysis is much easier than we think. But I think what you're talking about um, is special autocatalysis that does something um, in terms of making function. And I think you're right. And I think, you know, both you and I share a fascination for seeing how we might firstly engineer that and then not watch it naturally, whatever that means, that word natural or abiotically or randomly emerge. And I think that's a really important question, how we can engineer it on one hand and then how we can watch the same type of thing emerge. And that is going to be where I think all the excitement is, certainly for me. Thank you. I, I also looked at one of the questions from the audience who somebody called M. Force, I'm not sure if that's the name, uh, because what molecular assembly index would a polymer of RNA have? So, okay, so the molecular assembly index, first of all, aims at, look at what you want to do is um, look at molecules. You can do the polymer, but the way to think about it is to say, first of all, let's take the monomers in RNA and, and, and write down the assembly number. And then if you then take, say, um, a, a, um, three base pairs, different base pairs of RNA or four, you can then say the assembly number of those would be simply summed up. You might have some scroff duplication, so the assembly number might be lower, but say like typically a trimer of RNA where each base pair would be different. The assembly number would be way over the, uh, the, the threshold we see for life. So probably about 30, very, very high. Um, the, so, and the interesting thing is, this means when you see really, in, really quickly, even a trimer, a, a, a ligama of RNA with three base pairs in it cannot form naturally, not in the universe lifetime, impossible. So the problem then we have is like, what, where did that come from? So RNA, people would probably say, well, that looks like it's a molecule that is, that is present in life, but what if it would be some random tripeptide or, a, or some amino acid with, a, with, with some oligoethylene glycol attached to it? So something clearly abiotic, I guess. Um, how, would you, how would you define the, the number in that case? So in those cases, in the so in our experiments so far, we have shown we have been able to see quite consistently you do not get molecules with a of a very high assembly number coming out even when you have um, messy peptides present. You just don't form them. You just get a vast mess. So, but when you when you stack the deck, use pure reagents and maybe add them in order, suddenly it, you. Um, can create very complex molecules, but actually the information came from the chemist because they had a recipe. If you put everything in the pot at the beginning and you don't mandate high purity and you really are very careful to say, okay, I'm gonna be unbiased and do it, you do not get anything with really a high assembly number yet. You must at some point, there must be a mechanism by which that happens, but it's not in the prebiotic reverse engineering, I call it. There's something else that has to happen lower down. And my guess is that it's a very simple kind of almost like a um, kind of series of Roman arch templates. Like you, you make an itty bitty small arch template. So you can build a bridge. And then with that bridge, you can build another bridge. You keep going and keep going and keep going until you have RNA. And I think that if you were to find RNA, you RNA is so complex, you need an entire um, functioning cell to be working with it. The RNA world that is presented never existed because the RNA world probably requires more information than you could ever generate in a universe lifetime. And therefore, we have to, not, rather than become a creationist, because I'm most certainly not, there is a naturalistic explanation, is that it's a different chemistry that invents RNA. And RNA is very late. So I think I'm not arguing that RNA isn't important. It's just the, one of the last things 
and there was open-ended evolution before RNA. Well, we clearly don't have Jack on the show tonight to, uh, to, to help us uh, fight that battle. Um, so <laughs> I wanted to move on to, to the next question that Oliver McGuire is asking. Uh, he says, with assembly theory, you focus on the minimum number of steps to a molecule. But this doesn't factor in the f th that the fastest route to a molecule may not be via the minimum number of steps. Yeah, that's correct. Assembly theory is a probabilistic theory. By focusing on the minimum number of steps, you want to find out what is the shortcut you're going to get there so you don't get fooled. So assembly theory is not supposed to tell you anything about synthesis roots. It's about to say, oh, that molecule is complex. It gives you a complexity number that's objective in a random world. So what complexity theory, sorry, what assembly theory allows you to do is have that scale. Of course, some molecules you will make via much more complicated routes than the graph of cutting it up because there's contingency in biology. And also one thing that biology does very well is it shares reactions. So rather than just having the shortest route to go up one mountain, why not go up to intersect intersection between two mountains so you can go up, so you can do, so your net effort is lower. My biology wants to minimize energy expenditure and that energy expenditure is going to build in um, um, cooperativity and complementarity. And your question is spot on that assembly theory is not about that. Assembly theory is about saying, oh, I found a molecule that looks complicated. Did biology produce it? And let's compare it to my random um, exploration my, to make sure I've got control. And then I can know how complex it is. That's the way to think about it. It's like a bit like the way you would see if um, someone was cheating at poker. Like some, you would find someone was stacking the deck if suddenly you, you kept getting rural flushes all the time. The assembly number for a rural flush is similarly very high. Um, but you can build up smaller, you know, kind of um, uh, um, wins by using information to pull that in. It will take a longer time. Looking at this assembly theory, could you also apply that to reaction networks. So could I do a similar approach that you take for uh, assigning a number to a molecule, also assign such a number to a network? So you can do better than that. The, the, I, I think that the, the, what you can do is infer the presence of high assembly number molecules by looking at the network of reactions that are correlated. So what assembly number says really is like, the assembly number says, how many, how many pieces of information do you need to know about this molecule? So what you can do is you can also project. So the short answer is yes. You can basically project assembly number um, uh, theory into network theory. OK, and, and, and Sarah's team and my team are doing this right now because I think we can infer the presence of um, techno signatures in exoplanet atmosphere, industrial pollutants. Um, using assembly theory and the knowledge of the background chemistry um, by looking at, you know, of aliens making CFCs or other things. And you need to look at those correlated rate constants and you need to have a fairly good view of the planet. So this is not data you're going to get now, maybe 20, 30, 40 years. But nevertheless, in the laboratory, if you're using looking at networks, you can also use assembly theory there. OK, we may definitely make a big, big jump there. Um, um, which brings us maybe to the sort of larger picture on, on, on space. Um, one of the questions I had, you, you said that you were using a Bayesian approach and you're using a prior to, to in a way prime your, 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 your computer. Uh, I was thinking about the recent work on phosphine on Venus <laughs> where people came up with a, a very promising looking peak uh, that the only explanation that that could be was that there was phosphine on Venus. Now, most of the scientists who were not on that team and not a co-author on that paper would say, well, they simply didn't subtract the background in the right way. And the peak was generated by their curve fitting algorithm, essentially. Uh, um, however, uh, it turns out that when you talk to the original authors on the paper, they, they say, well, actually, if you have a prior that there is phosphine present on Venus, then there is a, fine, a small but finite chance that indeed you did detect Venus. 
And I was wondering, well, that's clearly you have too much of a bias there. Uh, there is no phosphine on Venus as far as we know, and there shouldn't be in terms of the chemical conditions that are present. Uh, um, but this is a similar risk in your work where you obviously have some kind of prior that might already bias the outcome of your experiment. Oh, well, there's a lot there. Well, let me, so, okay. Um, the, the, that's correct. You could put it, the, the thing about using a Bayesian approach or any type of information approach is you know what you've done at the beginning. You've got a record. So then you can question those assumptions at any time. So the nice thing about knowing what your priors are, you can, do, you can have different priors and you can randomize them. So that's good. Going to the Venus thing, well, there's lots of, the Venus thing I think was an exercise in poor science communication. Um, I think that, and also maybe um, there's a couple of things that got muddled. The first thing is that there was a suggestion that phosphine is a biosignature because phosphine is produced by biology. That is not the case. And you probably know also better than me, phosphine does not get generated inside a cell. There is no metabolic pathway to make phosphine. However, if you have phosphate pushed out by a cell, and there's a reducing agent nearby that was being made by biology, but reducing agents don't need to be made by biology, you'll make phosphine. So on Venus, you could have phosphine if there was volcanic activity, some iron metal was exposed, and there was some phosphate, and you could get the pH right, you would produce phosphine. So I think that the whole argument got really convoluted and having one prior here and one prior there, and then mixing up the hypotheses got everyone a bit muddled. And, and then there's also the fact that the observation, it, um, it, there's, there's questions about the observation. But the, the ironic thing is for me, even if the, if the observation of phosphine was correct, who cares? It's not a biosignature. So what you need to have is proper network ah, but information. Uh, their argument was, of course, that it was actually produced by uh, bacteria, for example. Yeah, so but, they... ba but bacteria don't produce phosphine. Well, there's, there's I think no that was their pathway. argument, I guess. Uh, yeah. Actually, moving on to the phosphine on Venus, because it's neither our paper. Uh, uh, there's a question from Gleco, who says, is funding the only limit for your ideal chemistry computer? <laughs> funding? No, 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 no. I mean, funding is very important. And, and now, um, given what's happened in the world last year, there's lots of soul searching going on in all countries, right? About how we we fund science and so on. I think there's, but let's not let's let's park that to one side. I've been very fortunate to get funding, and one of the things that I've been able to do with my team um, is build almost like a coalition of funders. Um, and and also, I started really simple, um, and over time, I built expertise in in maybe four different domains: synthetic chemistry. Com state computer science, state machines programming, uh, engineering the chemistry, and then the integration of the analytics. So the most important thing are the people on this, like the people on the slide. Getting the right people to talk together has been one of the most fascinating and um, um, fa um, really a kind of rewarding things. Getting people in a team where you get a synthetic chemist who's willing to listen to a computer scientist, who's willing to listen to an engineer, He's willing to listen to a mathematician and then vice versa. Roboticists are scared of chemicals in a lab and some chemists are scared of the programming of the robots. And they're not so much now and it's really come on a lot. So I think for me, the limitation was getting the right people together and building the teams. And I've been really lucky um, that my team has been um, so open-minded to my madness. <laughs> I think that's why they do it. They're, they're all equally afflicted by my madness. So they kind of build a, you know, like a, a self-help group. <laughs> uh, don't, don't tell the funders that it is a self-help team. Um, actually, talking about funding a bit more, um, the question from 626B, why do you think the general field of science is more interested in putting funds into the Large Hadron Collider than instead of the origins of life. I, I think not the general, I, I think the science is not, but the funders might be. Yeah, I, I, so I think that, I, I think that um, the, 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 mm, let's go back. The reason that CERN is so successful goes back to what happened after the Second World War. Basically, you had all these nuclear physicists, you had to give them a job, as far as I can work out. You don't want nuclear physicists unemployed, right? That was bad, that would be bad. 
But then that wasn't the real reason. Then it went on and CERN was very successful and the revolution in understanding the universe. What do people want to know? They want to know why we're here. They want to know what's going on in the universe. But I think that the origin of life and artificial life and alien life also fits into that category. And I think that CERN just, just has a very, is very good, very professional. And CERN has done a number of really important things. It's made a worldwide collaboration in the discipline. Physicists are grumpy too, not just chemists and other, uh, you know, getting physicists to collaborate on something like that because they can't do the project on their own. It was really great. So what I would love to do, one of my ambitions is to help nucleate a worldwide initiative on making artificial life and origin life. And let's collaborate together. All the chemists get together. You know, we'll still argue a bit, but we'll have a bigger cause. And I also think- I, I, uh, Lee, I fully support that. If the committee of the Radboud Glasgow Collaboration Fund is looking tonight, this is your chance to make the first step in that direction. <laughs> uh, because I think it's, it's definitely the, 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 the point that uh, we should collaborate more and we should integrate uh, sort of real experiments going on in different labs. Uh, and I think your approach uh, using a robot build or a algorithm build analysis uh, is really the way to connect different labs. Uh, I would also say that uh, I probably agree that origin of life or life in the universe is as big a question as whether the Higgs boson exists or not. And I think funders are perfectly happy to, to fund us. Uh, and they realize that we don't really need a billion. So, so in that respect, CERN has a head start, but we, we don't really need that much funding. Well, I, I, would, I would say we do need a billion distributed over the labs for the hardware. The other thing I would say quickly is I remember a few years ago that, that there was a Dutch um, TV program called The Mind of the Universe that I was on. And that really showed me that the Dutch public really fascinated by the origin of life, really support it, really like it. They are not going to give you a billion. That's the problem with the Dutch. Uh, so <laughs> Dutch funders, if you're looking now, uh, you can't do it on the cheap. You, you should really make sure that you fund excellent science here. So that's a, that's leading. But I think for the fact audience. to captivate the public, I think the Dutch public are very enlightened. I think the UK public are as well. And there's lots of people around Europe and maybe the US and further afield. So I think that people are interested in this question, the meaning of life through chemistry. So maybe touching on, on that general public, what lessons can we learn from understanding the origins of life for the challenges we face in life today? So I think that's a really nice question. I think we need to understand what life is on Earth right now. I've, be I've become to realize this, and particularly in my interactions um, across the different um, disciplines, talking to Sarah Walker's team in Arizona, talking to your team, talking to philosophers, in that if we don't really understand what life is on Earth, now and how it started. What is, what is gonna to happen to humanity? So actually I think understanding the origin of life and funding that is even bigger imperative than the Higgs because we need to know how is the internet gonna evolve? What happens when we get AI that can evolve and make decisions? What, how does consciousness emerge from in, in a living system? All these things we need to understand to understand how humanity is gonna survive for another, you know, um, you know, for a million years. And I think that is, so it's not just a philosophical question, like where do we come from? It's where are we going and what might happen to us? And can we predict the next pandemic? And can we predict the next internet revolution or what's gonna affect our culture? Because evolution is obviously occurring in language, in culture and so on. And this is, this is about information propagating. The information in our culture has a direct causal link all the way back to the last universal common ancestor. So when you see the silly Twitter meme today, know that evolution created that from Luca. There's a kind of profound connection you can make. Um, uh, anyway. Uh, that took a few billion years. Um, a couple of questions, first from David Möhringer. He says, as a first year student in chemistry, I don't have all the insights and experience yet, but can I imagine that your research pushes computational chemistry to new levels? So it, yes, indeed, we do do a lot of computational chemistry, and, but also what we do is we do a lot of um, embodied computation. So 
what I do a lot of is I mix the molecule. I could calculate what the molecules could do in a big supercomputer, or I could mix them in a pot and do the reaction and then look at what they do using mass spectrometry. Both have a place. And what we're doing in our lab is trying to make a simulation like, a, like the matrix, if you like, the matrix of molecules, as in the film trilogy, the matrix, and the real molecules, and look at the differences. Because by understanding what we are seeing in the chemistry that's different to the simulation will tell us the answer to what evolution and fire selection is. And that's why it's very important that we as agnostic as possible. And that goes back to the previous question about looking at those priors, because you can put priors into the computer model as well as the chemical model, and you can switch the priors in the computer model more quickly than the chemical model and look at the differences. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. I see that M. Force is back and he or she says uh, money can't buy good ideas. That's not really a question, uh, M person M. Force. Uh, I also don't think that we really have a shortage of, of ideas. Uh, we definitely the shortage bit is on the money side. Uh, I don't know if Lee agrees on that one. I would say, I mean, but money, so look, ideas, to some degree, ideas are relatively, I would encourage particularly young people to have more ideas and not be afraid of being told they're silly. Of course they're silly. They're new ideas. And one of the things I was never afraid of growing up was being told that my ideas are silly. I was used to being told I was stupid and silly. So when I have this big idea and I talk to my peers and they look at me as if I'm insane and say, that's silly, you know, that's not, that doesn't really dissuade me. So it's, what is important about those ideas is that you have time and you get to work with really talented people and experts to basically convince them how to go at those ideas. And that costs money because basically you need to pay people to work on the ideas. And then, you know, a good idea is cheap. The computer idea was fairly cheap. Building that computer was five years and lots of lots and lots and lots of work from maybe 25 people dedicated on that project. From building the PCBs on the in the pumps and the valves, for designing the software, for checking the chemistry, checking it was safe and all that stuff. So I would agree with you that money doesn't give you idea no ideas, but I would say that money actually is instrumental in working out if an idea is good or not. Because you know what? I don't feel bad when I spend money on an idea and it fails, as long as I get my criticism quickly and I realize, ah, oh, it's not gonna work, I'm wasting my time. And one of my most heartbreaking things I do in this job sometimes is to say to myself and then to my team, we did that, it was a really good idea, but na the na nature, not the journal, nature as in the world said no. So therefore we should move on and try something else instead. And so that gives us a bit of humility to kind of interact with the world and just have fun doing science. I know that feeling. Um, Jeroen van der Wiel has another question. Uh, he says, is the origin of life or prebiotic chemistry really something you can detect? You can maybe only partially trace it back, but you cannot quite predict where it will be going. So I would say, um, um, well, let me tell you, on Earth, we're not going to know what happened, and I don't care what happened on Earth, right? I want to make a new life form. But let's consider the following idea, that there are exoplanets we can detect, and the exoplanets are either dead, um, alive, technological, or um, have, um, have, and have died, uh, were living ones that have died. So now we can look up in the sky, and I'm saying, when you look at, if you see some stars tonight, there'll be planets around those stars. I want you to think, okay, are those planets dead, alive, technological, or one, or kind of like, you know, um, artifacts? I mean, that's amazing. In the same way there are stars being born in the universe, there is life emerging and life dying. That's the theory. I don't have any proof, but we haven't looked yet. And every time we've looked for these type of things with, you know, we have always worked that we are exceptional um, in the universe. But every time we've challenged that, we've found out that we're relatively ordinary. So how exciting it would be to look out there and find worlds transitioning. And that's one of the reasons why I want the origin of life chemists to stop worrying about origin of life on Earth, because it seems irrelevant to me 
right now, whereas they can look up in the sky. Don't look, I mean, I want to look down in my test tube. I love my test tube, but I also want to look up in my sky and know if I can invent life in my test tube now, I can tell you where to look for life in the universe. Whereas if I'm doing a history lesson in my test tube, I don't ever expect to make life. And so the problem with the origin of life as a discipline is no one actually expects to succeed. And that's no fair. Uh, that's very controversial. And we, we could talk about this for a, a lot longer. Um, maybe one final question that we ask a lot of our, uh, our guests. Um, every scientist has individuals who are important to their career. And is there anybody that you can mention that really set you on the track that you are on now? Oh my gosh, so many people. I mean, I could list from, you know, from when I, from teachers at school, if we're going to university. But I think what I would like to um, point out is I've had the privilege to interact with people from different disciplines. And one thing I did very early on in my career is I went to odd conferences. I once went to an architecture conference. I think I was invited by mistake because I did a paper on inorganic architecture. I wasn't as a joke, but, but I, and I talked to an architect and the architect introduced me to 3D printing. And that's why I started 3D printing. I went, that's a silly idea. Why are you doing that? And I went, oh, hang on, I 3D print test tubes in my lab. And that's why I started doing all the 3D printing and the robotic stuff many, many years before anyone else. So I would say that um, talking to people from different disciplines and also not, pa not passing judgment on people as a function of their, where they are in the hierarchy it's always been helpful. In fact, I've always raised against the hierarchy. And so I, because I'm a, um, a rebel. And so I think that really my heart goes out to all the rebels out there because they are the ones that I, I'm trying to kind of be successful with and for. I think Lee, that is, a, that is an excellent advice, n not only to the rebels who are watching tonight, uh, but also to all the other young scientists. Uh, um, I hope that you enjoyed tonight's talk. Uh, the lesson is to be creative, to generate as many ideas as you can and think about evolution created biology. So with that, we're going to wrap up. I would like to thank you, Lee, once more for a wonderful thank evening. Uh, I thank our viewers. I thank the late night team. Some of them are here and the other ones are behind the screen. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I would say stay with us for, well, two more episodes. Uh, I'll see you back next month. Thank you so much.